Welcome to the Wiser Retirement Podcast, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, and guiding you to financial freedom is my co-host today, Andrew Pratt. Hey, Pratt. Uh, Andrew? Hey, Casey. How's it going? Good. So uh, I am in not-so-sunny Florida, where it's uh, warm and drizzly, and you're sitting at my desk. This is weird. This is what everyone else sees, I guess. Yeah. It's like I'm, 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 I'm the man on the outside. <laughs> Sitting at your desk, looking at a cloudy and slightly cold day here in Marietta, Georgia. <laughs> well, um, I do miss Wiser Global Headquarters, but uh, this is a horse week for us. My daughter is um, competing at Terra Nova, which is uh, just outside Sarasota. So uh, don't get down to Sarasota very often. It's kind of nice down here, actually. Uh, explains why the home prices are crazy high. Everyone wants to come here during the wintertime, I guess. So let's talk about um, the 60-40 portfolio. So if you're, uh, I think most people kind of know what we mean when we say 60-40, but basically that means 60% stock, 40% bonds in a portfolio. Historically, it's been a very efficient portfolio to invest in. It's, I think it, it, it's, honestly, it's my favorite retirement allocation. Um, we, we favored 70-30, I guess, for a little while because because of uh, hardly any yield in bonds. And for a while there, you got more yield yeah, in stock. Yeah. But the, the bond yields are coming back up. And, you know, I, I just everywhere I read, 60 portfolio is dead. 60-40 portfolio is dead. And honestly, what it comes down to it is you can't believe anything you see or read these days. Right. Um, because, you know, here, this is my opinion. Uh, I came back from the Schwab conference in Philly a few weeks ago. They had a whole panel on this and everybody on the panel had an incentive for you not to buy a 60, 40 portfolio. They were mm -hmm. alternative investors. You know, they're pushing some tactical strategy with their, with, you know, with a mutual fund or whatever it was. Um, I, I, st I still tell people it, I think it was two Christmases ago, I read this great article, great article in the Wall Street Journal on why value investing would be the way to go forward and no longer growth investing. And I sent it to uh, Brad Lyons at the time who was doing your job. And he responded back. He says, well, look who the look who wrote it. <laughs> and sure enough, it was right. like one of the biggest value fund managers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, it's like, yeah, of course you're going to write about that. that that's your agenda, right. which is uh, which is so frustrating. So I wanted to do um, a little quick segment here on the 60-40 allocation. And perhaps, perhaps this death has been over-exaggerated. Yes. Um, you know, as you mentioned, um, there's a lot of noise out there, clickbait, I guess, if you want to call it that, um, you know, We'll be honest though, the 60-40 portfolio uh, had a rough year in 2022. And I think that's where, um, you know, some of these, whether it's uh, news publications or fund managers, they're trying to pick on it because the 60-40 portfolio actually over time has done very well. And as you mentioned, it's it's a simple um, asset allocation strategy. It's, you can create it in a low cost and an efficient manner. And, you know, everyone's trying to sell you some, you know, not everyone, but a lot of people are trying to sell you something that's more complex um, and trying to get your business that way. So I think, um, you know, this was a good time to pick on it uh, after uh, 2022's performance of that benchmark portfolio. Um, but again, you know, it's done very well, you know, since if you go back, I think in the 1920s over, you know, almost 100 years, the portfolios on an annualized return basis has returned over 8%, which I think most investors would take that any given day. And then, you know, looking, you know, we at Wiser look at risk adjusted return and not just looking at, um, you know, the return side, but also the risk and um, the 60, 40 provides good balance. It's a moderate return with a moderate level of risk. And, this diversification does over time, you know, help provide uh, good risk adjusted returns to the portfolio. Yeah, we, when we do financial planning, we don't even account for an 8% rate of return. Our our assumption is portfolio, um, the most aggressive portfolio is gonna be around 6.6, 6.7%. Retirement portfolios are gonna be around five to 5.4%. 5 
So the fact that it can outperform a retirement benchmark is is uh, is good and and should be expected. I I will add too though that you know most investors don't get an eight percent rate of return, and that, and that's because right. they do things with their money like going going to cash at the bottom of financial crises. Yeah, um, and they're, that's and they're lose, lose. Yeah, and and so, they'll be like a bad year like twenty twenty two, and then they'll you know. Now, why was, why was 2022 so bad for a 60-40 portfolio versus any other portfolio? Yeah, so 60-40, um, you know, 40 that 40 is invested into the broad U.S. bond market index. You know, it's changed names recently. It's the um, Bloomberg U.S. bond aggregate. I think most people probably know it as the Barclays U.S. aggregate. Um, but typically, you know, Bonds and stocks do poorly when there's rising inflation and or rising interest rates. And, um, you, you know, starting in uh, 2022, we had the Fed raising rates to sort of tame and, and combat inflation. Um, and they raised, you know, now we're sitting at five and a quarter Fed funds rate. And, you know, we have to remember we were starting at zero. So the Fed raised interest rates 21 times in order to sort of fight inflation and slow economic growth in order to do that. Um, so in that type of scenario, bonds and stocks underperform because, you know, higher rates uh, affect prices and valuations, both on the uh, equity and fixed income side. So, for example, uh, the 10 year, what, what's it at now? 4.8 percent somewhere in there? Around there. It dropped yesterday, but yes, it's hovering around cool. that area. So maybe two years ago, that 10 year was was really low like what one two percent somewhere in there yeah yeah definitely so basically if you took all your money you bought a 10-year treasury which is a really really safe investment you weren't you were hardly keeping up with inflation so people would take additional risk and go to the stock market and and you get a higher yield you get what two and a half percent for a while there and the s p is a little less than that now uh, but you was willing to take you're willing you were willing to take on the volatility of the market to get that yield and potential growth going forward. So, it, so it, the ten year becomes kind of like your risk free rate. So think right. about it this way: if if yeah. your risk free rate now jumps to five percent, which is insane to think about, where from where we were even just two years ago, but especially three years ago. So a five percent yield rate of return. You think about in your you're getting that right now on cash accounts in, in some cases. Um, so a 5% rate of return to take on no volatility risk in treasuries, and then comparing that to the market, that means the stock market has to do better than 5% or else why would you even invest in the stock market right. at this point? Right. Yeah, so, I mean, so that, <laughs> so that whole process is, is money reshifting. That means that the private equity guy who used to do really good 10, 15% mm -hmm. rate of returns, the private equity guy, uh, he's, he's got to go do something closer to 15 to 20 now. Right? right to make it worth maybe higher than that honestly yeah and you know as you said the i think the long-term average for equity you know u.s equity volatility is 18 percent and you know why take that risk on where you know just based on expected four valuations um they're similar to where uh the valuations of risk-free bonds are why take that risk on when you know again risk-free bonds are a zero percent volatility um so yeah there's there's that thing to consider there's also you know if you're in a distribution phase of, in retirement and and or like a endowment or foundation that is seeking like a six percent seven percent or even less return um for your portfolio it, it makes sense to sort of rotate in these um you know into fixed income that's less risky, that's yielding that, um, you know, these long, longer term bonds that have those higher yields. So basically rising interest rates is what broke the 60, 40 allocation in 2022. How bad was it? Like how bad, you know, I know that there's very few times in history we had that much of a drop in bonds and stock. Right. Um, yeah, so that's the, I think the third, worst performance of the 60 port 60 40 portfolio portfolio over the past 95 years so um but then again 
you know, so it was down about 16% in 2022. Uh, if you look this year in 2023, that, that benchmark portfolio is up about 9%. So already we've, you know, recouped about half of that. Um, but yeah, the portfolio does tend to not do well in, you know, high inflation periods and then also significant, you know, risk off periods like recessions. Are you curious why annuities keep coming up as a potential investment option? People are often told that annuities can effectively mitigate investment risks and help secure their financial future. However, annuities often benefit the salesperson and might not be the best choice for you as a consumer. To learn more about the various types of annuities, the negatives of owning them, and better investment alternatives, we have a free ebook on our website just for you. To download our ebook, Buyer Beware, Why Do They Keep Trying to Sell You That Annuity? Simply click the link in the episode notes or visit wiserinvestor.com slash guides. Now let's get back to the episode. So Andrew, have you looked at the allocation or the performance difference between uh, inflation periods where, or, or interest rate periods where interest rates are coming down versus going up? Yeah, so I haven't specifically looked at the average for, um, you know, when interest rates have gone up and how that portfolio has underperformed. Um, but, you know, when interest rates do go down, which there are two significant 40 um, year periods, you know, one from 1940 to 1980 and the other uh, 81 through 2021, uh, the 1940 to 1980 period, the portfolio returned about 8% annualized. And then 1981 through 2021, the portfolio return 10 and a half percent analyzed. So, you know, and then I guess just for a, an example of a rise in rate environment period, we can just go back to the 2022 return where the benchmark portfolio uh, was down 16%. Um, so you can see, you know, generally over the long term, rates are, you know, once inflation is under control um, and, um, you know, interest rates are falling, the portfolio does perform well over those long periods of time. So, and, and this is nothing crazy. This is not like a, a wi special wiser and model. This is, this is just stocks and bonds, right? That right. you, <laughs> that you looked at that time period with and which kind of brings me to the point of, you know, why do we make investing so complicated? Like why, why is, why is it that our industry thinks that there's this secret sauce because it 10% per year or even 7% per year, per year there's per no year. way that active managers are ever keeping up with that. Right. Uh, right. It, right. Statistically it's going to be impossible, but yet, you know, you, you sit down with other advisors and in industry and say, Oh no, I have this secret formula that I do. And I can't tell you exactly how, how I create it, but that, you know, I'm going to charge you two and a half percent per year. <laughs> <laughs> for the strategy and in the end you've been better off with just a simple allocation uh, a fund that represents all the stocks and all the bonds and I, you know i'll answer my own question the problem is human nature right because when it goes sideways like 2022 we assume that it's broken we liquidate it and uh, we go and find the next gadget in the meantime we've 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 lost the ability to to you know to participate in the rebound mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like yeah. it's um, Baskin Robbins with um, some of these portfolio managers, the new flavors, of the month. Um, and they're return chasing and, and just really what is the most attractive um, investment uh, based on that you know recent recency bias and the return recent return history. So when we look at a 60-40 portfolio, we're again we're only talking stocks and bonds. We're not working yeah, we're in working gold. gold. We're not doing real estate. We're not doing um, anything special in that allocation. Uh, and I think that that's what a lot of people try to do is they take that that pure 60-40 and they're going to put a 10% sleeve of something else, right? Or a 5% sleeve of something else. And also to kind of add on to that, it is U.S. stocks and U.S. bonds. And yeah, that's true. And so international would be another diversification. Although you could argue that the S and P 500 is pretty global investment at this point. Yeah, um, if you do like a um, revenue history, or you know, I think it's 
I remember, I think it's 45, 50% ish of the revenues are from multinational companies that are in the S and P 500. So yeah, I, I guess from that perspective, it is global. So we think about like the worst every year is, you know, you're talking about 20, um, 2022, uh, down 17% during the great depression in 31, it was down 27 during the 1937 crash. It was down 20. So for modern history, this is this was definitely the biggest down year at seven down seventeen percent in twenty twenty two. Right. Uh, the next worst one was the bear market from seventy three to seventy four. It was down fourteen. Um, interesting enough, the dot com crash it was only down four point nine um, in two thousand one. Um, the great uh, see what in 08, it was down thirteen point nine. That's pretty good, uh, partially because. You know, bonds typically move up, right? When stocks are falling, people right. are running right. to, the, to the to the it's the fear trade. People are running to those bonds. Yeah, it's a yeah. flight to quality yeah. or safe haven assets. Um, you know, usually in recession time periods. Um, but yeah, and also too, if and whether how it's defined by the National Bureau of Economic. Um, you know, how they define recessions, um, whether it's post rate cuts or not, bonds should outperform, you know, if rate cuts happen. And and the reason why is because, um, again, not to get really technical here, but they have this, you know, especially bonds with longer duration, um, you know, people are willing to ha hold a bond that has a um, locked in yield for just say a 10 year bond that has a locked in yield, you know, and if you know, rates are cut, they're, um, you know, investors, obviously those bonds are more attractive because this bond's paying a higher yield versus just say rates were cut back down to zero versus a bond that's essentially paying zero. So when we think about uh, stock bond correlation over time, do you feel like that stocks and bonds are becoming more correlated now? I mean, that's one of the uh, things that people say about modern day investing and specifically the 60 40 model is that there's no reason to own bonds anymore because it just it's almost correlated with stock they move up and down together yeah and this is something we did look at um so stocks are and bonds are co more correlated if you look at over the past one year um they're about uh ha they have about a 0.78 correlation and that correlation again just means that they're they would move in lockstep. So a zero correlation really means there's no relationship between two asset classes. A one correlation means that they're perfectly, uh, yeah, I'd say perfectly, but they they move in sort of lockstep. And then a negative one correlation on the other side means that they actually move in the exact opposites. So over the past year, stock and stocks and bonds have been fairly you know highly correlated compared to their long term average. Um, so that 0.77 is very high. If you actually just go back over the 10 years, um, stock and bond correlation has been around 0.3. You would expect it to be, you know, flat, you know, maybe slightly above uh, zero or maybe even slightly negative. But if we go back over the past, um, you know, 45 years, that average is, I think, like 0.2 of a correlation. So obviously compared, you know, from today to the long term average, those two asset classes are very correlated. But through history, this has happened before um, right. in the 90s and the 80s. There were time periods where stocks and bonds uh, did approach um, uh, near perfect correlation. Um, you know, that 0.78 seems to be a, be the high point. So it'd be very interesting to see what happens going forward, especially if we have a recession looming uh, in the next year, which is a whole nother right. conversation. Um, that's when I would think that bonds would suddenly become uncorrelated with stocks as people uh, make shifts in their risk tolerance. Right. And I think also too, as you know, the expect the market expectations for inflation and rising rates, um, you know, since the the most recent Fed meeting, um, those have started to fade. And actually, a popular a uh, tool to look at that you can just Google is the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange Fed forecast tool. And it shows um, where the market's expectations are on future um, Fed rate interest hikes. And, you know, looking one year out, you can, actually, you can actually have a forward outlook. Right now, there's 
no probability, basically essentially zero probability that will be another rate hike from here. And this is actually have, has been coming down over the past several months. And then, you know, just to put it in perspective, one month ago, we were at 7% for one more rate hike. So the market expectations now are, are saying that there's no more um, uh, interest rate hikes. Um, and that's also, it's been coming down from the communication from Jerome Powell at the last Fed meeting. And also yesterday's uh, CPI print was uh, beat expectations, beat meaning that it was lower than uh, inflation was lower, core inflation was lower than uh, what the market expected. And also based on that, um, the market is pricing in um, less interest rate hikes. Um, so Which, you know, I said yeah, that it also means that um, there's a chance of lower rates going forward, Fed lowering right. interest rates. Right. And I say all that because um, this is when bonds tend to do well is when, you know, because the, the main concern is that their rates are, there's going to be an unexpected rate change from where we're at now. So now based on, you know, the recent events, the market is, you know, yields have been coming down lower. And then as we spoke earlier, longer duration bonds have been outperforming um, ever since, you know, November 1st, you know, whether that, continues to hold true or not, we'll see. But um, again, it's just, if there's no more interest rate hikes, even if the he the Fed holds steady from here on out, uh, investors in the market will start to price in um, lower rates and yields. And that's what we've seen in the past few weeks with yields coming down. So I think what we're summarizing here is that the ETF or the 60-40 uh, portfolio is certainly not dead. Probably the best time to be retiring and building a 60-40 allocation. Um, right. and you know, sometimes you just have to wade through some nasty times, uh, in any investment strategy. I don't know of any investment strategy that's been straight up the entire time. No, <laughs> you know, sign me up for that one <laughs> when you find it. I know, right. But that's, but that's what people <laughs> expect. That that's the expectations people have is like, oh my gosh. And in 2022, I'm tired of losing money. But then if you look at their portfolio over the last 10 years, it's been an amazing 10 years, even at the worst point in 2022. You look back, you're just like, well, you've had a really good 10 year run. This is a right. little tiny blip uh, across across the screen versus where you've been and probably where we're going overall. Right. So I don't think I'll add to it's uh, politics and portfolios. I, th I think 2024 is going to be a horrible year um, to be a financial advisor, just from a politics standpoint. Um, probably a horrible year to be uh, at a college. You know, those young people with energized with all political action. You know, can't imagine right. uh, uh, what it's going to take to to keep college campuses uh, civil um, or even the coffee shop civil. Honestly. <laughs> Because we're look, we're looking at another rematch, Trump Biden, and Trump's got more baggage now than he had uh, uh, in in the in the first two times, right? So yeah. it's just very polarized. And the bottom line is, in a sixty forty model or any model built off of index funds, it just right. doesn't matter. It just yeah, doesn't I, matter. I completely agree with that, and to stay the course because if you uh, just for example, if you go back to um, the 2016 election, everyone was touting, oh my gosh, this is going to be the best time for financials and energy stocks with Trump, with his policies. And it was actually, I think during that period, it was one of the worst times for those sectors. So again, you you, you can't really game plan for that or you know, be very tactical around what you think the policy um, moves will be with the current president. So again, just stay the course and then, you know, just buckle up for the, for the volatile periods. Yeah, the only way to reduce that volatility is going to be short-term treasuries. I think that's what it comes down to. Um, I just go back to my litmus test. Do people still come here to start companies? Is still this country still operating under free market capitalism where a person can be born with nothing, have the ability to climb the ladder and build something? Um, and I, I still think the answer is yes. I think we live in a world where people uh, are I'm playing the victim. <laughs> There's a lot of people that have opportunities who, who won't take it and say, woe is me and blame everyone else. But I still meet many young people now uh, coming up through adversity that uh, are going to be rock stars or are already rock stars uh, where right. they are. And that's always my litmus test is 
you know, hey, if, if, if the government starts taking over industries, then we have a problem. And maybe right. this is no longer uh, the best place in the world to, to be uh, conducting business. But I, I think the bottom line is, is um, you know, politicians can do some damage, but uh, there's nothing that really squashes the American uh, economic system, really. You know, right. uh, when it comes down to it, <laughs> people, <laughs> people, people working, doing the work that has to get, has done, to get and done. And that's what you have to focus on when you're, when you're uh, looking at the, looking at the stock market long term. It's like, is this still a place we can do business? Uh, even if was, even with just all the wokeness that's going on in these large S&P 500 companies, which we have a tremendous exposure to. The bottom line is they're all having to do it to check a few boxes to make sure they, they show up in the biggest yeah, investment. Yeah. And, I, I, yeah. yeah. The bo bottom line is um, we don't have to do anything with ESG investing. It's all, it's all ESG investing at this point, just whether or not you're going to pay for a label at 15 X uh, mm -hmm. the price of the standard index. Um, but, but again, is this a place where you still can business? And I, I think the answer is resounding. Yes. Right. And again, the primary goal is your target rate of return to get you to retirement. Um, and whatever goal you set, <clears throat> excuse me, to meet that, <clears throat> that, that objective, um, you know, wokeness aside, that's what we're here for. And that's, and that's, we're building portfolios to meet those objectives and, and sort of, uh, filter out the the noise from you know individual companies and that's why investing in broad diversified indexes um yeah there might be some in there but it's still at a very minimal um you know on a whole absolute level it's a very small percentage if, if you're invested in an index fund that has index fund that companies in it, companies in it. yeah yeah it's like it's like i tell my teenage daughter right this is uh this this is where you, this is where all the girl drama is and you have to be five notches above that Right. <laughs> like, like you, you, you see it, you observe it, but you don't participate in it. And, and you just you got to be above it uh, the same way with politics and investing. There's all this noise and, and nastiness. And then the bottom line is you just you got to take yourself above it and not participate in it. Because right. nothing right. nothing good comes of it. In the end, you own yeah, sixty seven hundred companies, you own twelve thousand bonds. It's, it's not going to make or break uh, a portfolio, which is how it was designed. And statistically, right. Right. you have a you have a ninety eight percent chance of beating every active manager out there just mm -hmm. by owning the, the raw index. So it's it's um it's it, I don't know it I, I'm not, I'm not looking forward to it. Um, 20, 20, New Year's Eve of uh, uh, twenty four is going to be uh, hopefully the, <laughs> the beginning of a very short year. <laughs> Let's just hurry up and, and get through it. Yeah, and that is one big issue if you're trying to pick and choose names uh, and you have a smaller portfolio um, with individual companies is you introduce, it's called unsystematic risk or unique risk and that you're essentially diversify away with investing into a broad index. But if you have like, just say 20 names in your portfolio, you introduce this other level of risk and that could cause your portfolio in itself to be more volatile than, than the broad market. Yeah, we've seen that with uh, just some of our prospective clients, right? Where they, they pick these safe names uh, in their portfolios and they build their own stock portfolios, but they've underformed a benchmark by double digits um, because they don't, they don't understand how to build a diversified portfolio. And you're right, it takes 16 to 20 individual stocks to replicate a diversified portfolio, but you still got to pick the right ones right. Um, in, in the group. So, yeah, it just it just comes back to um, I don't know why people make investing so complicated. Uh, we have to have simple portfolios that that work. It works good, lasts a long time. Uh, and we have to focus our time around the planning, all the other things that no, no, well, I say no firms, but many firms don't even focus on is the plan itself. Once you built this plan, then then the portfolios will have that purpose uh, and you'll understand what the objective is and, and not to tinker um, with with something. But um, I will say that um, uh, for us, Andrew, you, I, I'll shift gears. I'll, I'll surprise you with a new topic really quick. Uh, we took emerging markets out of our portfolios um, th in the last few weeks. You want to talk a little bit about that and, and why we decided that emerging markets didn't really have a place inside our in our portfolios? 
Sure, I think there's a few reasons. One is uh, it was a very small allocation to begin with. Um, so just from a attribution standpoint, it wasn't really providing much diversification or you know differentiation from that regard. But also to um, if you just look over the long term, it's really hard. And I think they're you know not to kind of um, get off passive because I, I am a, I am a strong believer in passive, but I think there are some areas where active can do well, and I think passive emerging markets is not one of those. Um, it's really hard to kind of navigate the different um, geopolitical risk and you know in a passive uh, fund that's looking to get a market cap weighting to those types of risk, and um, so that was. That was the other reason. And, and then a third reason is just really just looking at the return and risk characteristics over the long term. And it, you know, had a worse profile from a from both from a return and risk standpoint compared to like a broad international developed fund. So based on all those reasons, we decided to remove it from the portfolio. And then we removed uh, the, the real estate investment fund also. Yeah, and somewhat similar. Um, rationale, obviously geopolitical risk aside, but, you know, just looking at the, the long term, over the long term, you know, total return, including because a lot of times people tout, uh, you know, REITs or public real estate to have uh, a nice yield. But if you look at the total return and um, it was less than the SP 500, which is one of our co core holdings in the domestic equity portfolio and also carrying more risk. So I sort of view it as our our base case um, benchmark is SP 500. If it makes sense to technically deviate deviate away from that, um, then we should. But in this case, uh, REITs, public REITs, didn't really provide that value for a risk adjusted return. And quite honestly, a lot of our clients have second homes or large primary homes um, that do check that kind of that real estate uh, box. And then all uh, our ultra high net worth clients. Um, have a lot of them have commercial properties and, and things individually, which uh, is very different than owning owning the REIT itself. Um, right. And I, I did notice that you know these flattening interest rates, REITs have gotten a little bit of a boost. So that was a little frustrating, but I think. Um, yeah. But it, we we still look at like large office REITs. You know, you have you have downtowns like just still empty. Uh, those buildings are not full, so that that's a risk too going forward. Yeah, the risk, I would say risk on um, asset classes like, you know, real estate, small caps got a little boost lately because of, you know, yields coming down, which makes sense because these are, you know, inherently riskier and with lower interest rate and lower discount rate, rate um, they're, you know, probably going to outperform for periods. But, you know, again, what we're looking at is over the long term and, you know, building portfolios with a strategic um, outlook. Um, so, um, but we still believe that, these moves are, um, you know, that these moves are warranted. All right. Well, thanks for that update. Um, thanks for listening to today's episode. If you're interested in learning more about Wiser Wealth or want to schedule a consultation, meet with one of our fiduciary financial advisors, you can do so by going to wiserinvestor.com. You can also click in our episode notes. Uh, in our notes, we also have uh, a reference, episode 182, Investing for the Long Haul, Creating a Retirement focus investment strategy. Uh, episode 165 was good. Five principles of successful investing kind of broke down our investment strategy. Uh, we have a YouTube channel called A Wiser Retirement, same as the podcast where you can watch this podcast live. Uh, pros and cons of dividend investing is uh, one I did uh, a few months ago. Also two buckets, um, two bucket investment strategy, income strategy versus total return is a video that we did for you guys. Um, you know, Andrew, I don't think that this podcast was entertain as entertaining as the last one on whiskey, but uh, we, we we kind of gone from uh, super uh, uh, super holiday fun to uh, back to business very quickly. But um, I, I did get a big money for that whiskey one, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and then we've we've uh, uh, we've I think we've got a few good shows here. I will produce here shortly for as we go out for 2023, but uh, thanks for your time. Enjoyed having or enjoy having you on the team. And uh, thanks to all, our, all of our listeners. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to a wiser retirement podcast. 
We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We'd also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. This episode was produced and edited by Ken Hopley. This podcast is strictly for informational purposes only and is not to be considered as investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any financial products, securities, digital assets, or any other investment vehicles or a basis to make any financial decisions. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor with the SEC. The host and or guest may personally own securities, digital assets, or other investment vehicles mentioned on this podcast. Neither the host nor guest of the show are compensated for their participation and no referral fees are paid to or received by any host or guest for clients, listeners, or similar interests. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor, tax professional, insurance professional, and or legal professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.